need to do this. I'm like, wow, I think you have the authority to say that. Is that better? That does make you nervous in worship. That last song, Jesus is a Redeemer, it just hits my heart every time I sing it. And uh, how often I think about that. But the, um, the scripture reads out of 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 24 through 30, and then continue to verse, uh, uh, chapter 12, 10, 9 and 10. It's page 970 in the Pew Bible. I'm on the same page, as a matter of fact. Let me check on my Bible here. Five times. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I adrift at the sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from any own, my own people, danger from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea danger from false brothers in toil and in hardships through many of the sleepless nights in hunger and thirst often without food in the cold and exposure and apart from other things there is, is a, da a daily pressure on me of my anxiety anxiety for all the churches who is weak and I am not weak who is made to fall and I am not Indignant. If I bo must boast, I will boast for the things that show me my weakness. The God, our Father, of the Lord Jesus, He who has blessed us forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Artaeus was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize him, but I was let down through a basket or in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped to escape his hands. Chapter 12, verses 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in wilderness, in weakness. Therefore, I will boast only the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus and for what he's done for us, for his done for us. We thank you that we're able to worship together in this house. And we feel your word and learn more about you. And most of all, most of all, we thank you so much that we're able to pass it on to others and be witness to others. But the more we learn, the better we are to be. Dear Lord, we pray that you keep the light in your word, that we see, let people see you through us. We ask you to serve this morning and to be the pastor who brings your word. We ask this in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. All right, anyone going to Children's Church? I believe now is the time. Brother Rob looks excited back there to receive you. And We're going to be in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, starting in verse 11, if you want to go there. Galatians, chapter 6, starting in verse 11. We have, we have come through the book of Galatians. Uh, Lord willing, today will be the last day we spend uh, in this book. We just heard about Paul's trials and Paul's hardships and the marks of Christ that he bore on his body. And today we're going to be talking about the very last message in this series from Galatians, the intentional Christian uh, bearing Jesus' marks in this world. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 11 through 18, and then we'll talk about those. Galatians 6, starting in verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand, Paul says. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. I'd like to pray before we get rolling here. Father God, we are grateful for your word. We're thankful for the courage you gave Paul. Uh, we're thankful for the brilliant mind that you gave him. But that was tempered with a love for the saints and a love for your church. Sometimes we don't pick that up when we read the scriptures. He's not barking out a bunch of rules because he's a Pharisee. He's telling us how we can be pleasing to you. And his love for the churches is evident. And the love for his brothers and sisters is evident. Especially in these personal ways that he ends his letter. So help us, Lord, to not only know the law, but know the love that wrote it. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be faithful ambassadors of Christ. Help us to boldly and proudly bear the marks of Christ. We want to see people saved and discipled, Lord Jesus. We pray that that will never be for selfish reasons because we want to see our egos massaged or we want to see our numbers increase, but we don't want to boast in the flesh of men, numbers of people at the altar, number of baptisms in the tank, Lord Jesus. We want to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ who transforms lives and regenerates spirits. May he be glorified in our fellowship and in the word we proclaim and in the lessons we teach and in the lives we live. And we ask all these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I ask, I covet your prayers. I really, really do as we wrap up. I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but as we wrap up this book of Galatians, which has been a challenge to preach, we're moving on into what I perceive is going to be an even more challenging book, and that is the book of Hebrews. Pray for me as we move there. Um, the book of Hebrews is going to show us how Jesus Christ fulfills all of the Old Testament prophecies, how he is the embodiment of the temple and the sacrifices, and all, all of it ties together. It's, it's how Jesus did it. it. It really is where the rubber meets the road as far as our faith goes. It's 13 chapters. It is a, it's an intimidating book uh, for me because it's so rich. And I don't want to miss any of it, and I don't want to rob you of any of it. So I, I just ask that you would, between now and the beginning of April, when we begin to preach through the book of Hebrews, I ask that you would pray for your pastor, pray for me, that I would do a good job of hearing the Holy Spirit and, and rightly dividing the Word. But we've come through this book of Galatians, and I hope you bear on your bodies the marks of this study, not like Paul where you were beaten with rods and so forth. That's not what I meant, but hopefully it hasn't been torturous for you. But we study the words of God for a purpose. Not just so we can get through another book of the Bible. And, and as soon as I say preaching through Hebrews or preaching through the, the human nature is to say, okay, well, when will we be done? Okay, that's so many chapters, and, and, we, and we just want to get through it. And then that's common to men. That, that's... Uh, not a disparaging remark, it's just the way that we are. When I say something's going to happen or you hear, here's what we're doing next, you want to know the beginning and the end of those things and that's, that's okay. But I hope that you've come through Galatians with a more firm grasp of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you're equipped. I hope you've studied to show yourself approved. I hope that you've taken the concepts that we've gone over. Paul does it over and over and over again. I hope that you've taken the concepts of that Paul's laid out, and you've wrestled those through during your weeks, and you've read the scriptures during your weeks. We've seen a lot, and it's up there on the screen for you, some of it. It's certainly not all of it. But this is to equip us, so let's quickly review. We've seen warnings against false gospels, and Paul laid out exactly what the false gospels are. They're always gospels of works, where your effort earns you X, Y, and Z. That's always what a false gospel is. It always has to do more with you than Jesus. Warnings against false gospels. Uh, a defense of his apostleship. 
Uh, the reason that we listen to what Paul says is because he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, indwelt with the Holy Spirit, to write the Word of God. And he wrote much of the New Testament, not to his glory, but to Jesus' glory. He's an apostle, and we listen to the apostles. And I hope you've come through Galatians saying, I want to hear from apostles. I want to hear from those that God has commissioned to write Scripture. I want to rely on the written Word of God. He has the authority to teach, and I hope you recognize that. And I hope through that you've recognized the authority of genuine teachers of the gospel who rely on the word, not on being cute to get you, keep you entertained and so forth. So next, to trust in Jesus' word, that this is the authoritative word of God. It is inerrant, it's infallible, and it's sufficient. There aren't any historical errors in it. There are no errors in the word of God. Plus it's infallible, which means that Everything it tells you about your life and how you should live it, it's true. If you put these principles into play, your life will be far more blessed than if, if, if you don't. It is, it, it's infallible. If you live this way, you'll be pleasing to God, no doubt. And it's sufficient. We don't need more self-help books. We have this. We don't need more teaching. We don't need extra biblical teaching. I don't need to hear about your fresh revelation from Jesus Christ. He has revealed everything that He's going to reveal. That's the very first thing we're going to see in Hebrews. He's given us everything we need for life and righteousness, and it's in here, and it's in the teaching in the mouths of the teachers, and it's in the fellowship of the church. We don't need to look elsewhere. That's what Eve did. Amen? Isn't that right? What God said wasn't enough, she looked elsewhere. And look at the pickle we're in, right? So, we don't need to look elsewhere. I hope you've come away with that. Finally, next, salvation is through grace alone by faith alone, in Christ alone. It is God's work. It's, it's due to the covenant promise of God, not your works. You weren't benevolent, benevolent enough to give your life to Christ. He saved your life. That's the difference. It's the work of God. and it's through. He didn't choose you because you were worth it. He chose you because He loves you. And that's why you're saved. And that's important to remember. And Paul went on and on about that in, the, in, the, in uh, Galatians. Faith in Christ, we learn next, is that that means adoption into the family of God through faith. We're heirs of the kingdom. We're no longer paupers. We are wealthy beyond our wildest imaginations. And we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit as, as chosen and choice instruments of God to expand His kingdom in the world. We will get all the glories of the kingdom, but now we labor in the righteousness of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. We are ambassadors and warriors commissioned by God to unflinchingly and unapologetically speak the word of God into a lost and dying world and see people saved. That's what we're here for. We saw that Jesus set us free from sin and works. We're no longer slaves to the sins that we commit. We're no longer going to be punished eternally for the sins that we commit. The sins that we commit, we commit in the flesh. The life we live, we live in the spirit of, of Jesus Christ. God set us free from sin and from works. We don't have to rely on them anymore. But we'll see them increasing because the Holy Spirit's that way. He's sanctifying us. Christ, and that's the next thing. Christian freedom results in righteousness. We'll be far better at keeping the law after we're saved than we were before. And we'll enjoy it. And we'll embrace honoring God as our preferred lifestyle. We've seen all of that in Galatians. Finally, we see that true faith yields love for the brotherhood. We'll love one another. We'll labor together. We'll forgive one another. We'll confront one another when we need to. We'll forgive each other even when we don't. You know? And we will have each other on our minds. We'll be intentional about the brotherhood and sisterhood of Jesus Christ. And we'll be good to all people. We'll be good. Remember what Jesus said? Why do you say I'm good? Only God is good. Remember when he said that? When well, we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we have the capacity now to be good. We can be like Christ. We can be good to people. Amen? Shouldn't we be good to people? Especially the lost and dying sinner that desperately needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Should we not be good to them? Should we not be good to one another? Just be good to one another. Quick to forgive. Slow to judge. Man, all that good, being good is hard. Amen? It's not like being nice. I'm not talking about being nice. That's the 11th commandment. That thou shalt be nice. Gotta be nice. No, I'm not saying be nice. I'm saying be good. Sometimes if I'm to be good to you, I have to confront you. Sometimes if I'm going to be good to you, I, I, I need to sit down and look you in the eye and say, hey, we got an issue here. You know, sometimes that's what happens. But we've learned all of that through Galatians, that Christianity isn't a, a passive event that happens to us. It, 
It's, it's, a, it's a saving work that God does in our lives, and he saves us to a life of purpose and power and passion and service and ministry and truth and love and courage. He left us here to be the aroma of Christ in a dying world. But he didn't leave us alone, amen? He didn't leave us as orphans. He didn't say, now get out there and knock them dead, kiddo. No, no, no. He's with us. He clothes us in his armor. He fills us with his spirit. He gives us his heart and his mind. We have the mind of Christ, Paul says. So let's look at just three things in clothing. In clothing. I'm sorry. I've got this cold, and it's going to be an adventure. So. <clears throat> and it is a cold. I'm not going to explode or anything. Just a sniffles. All right. Verse 11. Let's take a look once again at chapter 6, verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Paul usually, it was not uncommon, and, 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 and I have to tell you this because it makes the point more clear. Writers in the New Testament and writers back in the day of Scripture would use scribes to write letters for them. Uh, these are long letters. You may have noticed, even reading through, you're like, that's a, long, that's a long letter. I've never written a letter that long in my life. You may have thought that as you're reading through, especially Hebrews, mercy, that guy, you know, that's a long letter. So the apostles would often dictate. They would, and the person that wrote the letter is called, ready for your scramble word, and I've said this before, it's a, a menuensis. Woo, that's a lot of points. You can get a menuensis. An amanuensis or a scribe would take and they would write for the apostle. Well, that's not cheating. That's the way that it was done. So Paul would often uh, close his letters with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with you. That's how he would close it. But not here. Here he goes on a long, well, relatively long, handwritten. The scribe had written and now he's taking over the letter. He's right. see with what large letters I write to you. In my own hand. This is important. This time he takes pen in hand and writes a closing paragraph because he is so concerned about these Galatians that are running off after these false teachers. He has gone there and he's planted the church and he's like, look, you guys are running after false teachers. I'm, I'm confounded by you. I'm not even sure that you're regenerate. You're so quickly being deceived. I, look with, I, this is, I mean this. And he, and he writes it with, with his own hand. I mean this. I'm not dictating some diatribe to you that 15 rules you need to follow to have a better life. I, 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 my heart is broken for you, saints. And that's how every true teacher of the Word has to feel about the hearer. That's how every pastor ought to feel about his, or his church. And, and I confess that I don't always. I'm a human being, but the overriding Two principles of preaching and teaching and leading in the church is one, a desperate love for Christ. Followed very closely on the heels of that is a desperate love for the people. I want to see Christ formed in you. I can't say anything any better than Paul says it. That's the goal. Not that you would be entertained, though that's part of teaching. Amen, right? The, the message has to be somewhat entertaining. I mean, you can't just bore people to death and say, well, it's on you to learn, you know, and just be up here, you know. You have to, God's gifted teachers to teach. There has to be some interaction there, but it's, it's, it's on you to learn. I've sat through many a boring sermon. Some of them I've preached. And, 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 and I've sat through many a boring Sunday school class where I'm thinking, does this person even know the Bible? I mean, they're, they're, they're reading through the literature given to them by whatever organization to purchase the literature from and they're just reading through and then they ask that question with the blank in it where nine out of ten times the answer is Jesus you know the, 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 and, and, and they just read through that and you're like wow this is not very edifying but but even in those classes if you're listening to the word that's being read even by the people sitting around the table that are forced to because the book says have someone read you know even if that's the way that it's it's working I have never and, and I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting because I don't want to lie. Certainly if not from here. I can't recall, let me put it that way. I can't recall ever coming through a Bible study class, no matter how inept the teacher seemed to be, where I didn't walk away with something new from Christ. If the Word of God is opened and preached and taught, even haphazardly and poorly, the Word is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. 
And if I'm listening, and if I'm trying to learn, I'm going to learn. If I say, I dare you to teach me, that's a whole different story. So we want to be receptive learners. It's on us to do. But Paul cares about what he's teaching. And he closes with some things. So let's close with some things, okay? We're going to look at at three reminders that he he sums up everything in Galatians in in these three reminders. And it's, it's, it's as germane and pertinent to us today as it was to them then. First, reject false gospels and false teachers. Do you want to bear the marks of Christ? You may not go to prison for Jesus. Amen. Don't you hope you don't? I mean, wouldn't you prefer not to? That's okay. That's okay. I'm not judging, oh, if they don't want to go to jail for Jesus, they must not love him. That, no, no, no. We don't want to suffer for the name, though we should be prepared to be it's a martyr that wants to die for the faith, right? And, uh, the first century church saw a lot of that, where people would intentionally put themselves in harm's way and intentionally die for the faith, where they knew that that would be the outcome so that they could earn heaven points. And when they got there, God had to say, that's not what I wanted from you. All right? so, but, re- but we should bear the marks of Christ. One of them is that we reject false gospels. We won't tolerate them. And we reject false teachers. We'll try and bring them to a point where they're enlightened and no longer ensnared by the devil devil to do his work, but we are going to uh, not just tolerate false teachers. We can't let that slide. So let's take a look. Galatians 6, 12 through 13. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do, the, do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you uh, circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. This is the Judaizers. These men were coming into the church and they were saying, yes, you can be a Christian, but Christianity is really an offshoot of Judaism. So what you're going to do, if you're going to be a good Christian, you have to also follow the law of Moses and trust in this Jesus. Well, that's a false gospel. Jesus plus equals false gospel. I don't know if you want to write that in your bulletin or write that in your Bible or whatever. Jesus plus something equals false gospel. If I need Jesus and confession to get to heaven, false gospel. If I need Jesus and X number of days of church attendance in the year to get to heaven, false gospel. If I need Jesus plus a lot of good works, giving alms to the poor and taking this position politically and so forth. That's a false gospel. These guys just happen to be saying circumcision. If I walked in here and said circumcision, you'd laugh me out of the building. But if I walked in here and said, Jesus plus, if you really love Jesus, you'll be here at 9 in the morning to make coffee, you wouldn't laugh me out of the building. You'd say, maybe I better be in here at 9 o'clock in the morning to make coffee if I really love Jesus. And that's a wrong angle. That's me boasting in your flesh. If I go out to my fellow pastors, and boy, oh boy, this is so, 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 so common. It's heartbreaking. And I've been party to it, so I'm not saying I'm better. You get four pastors in a ministerial meeting in a town. Ministers love to have ministerial associations. We love it. Where we all come together and we sit in a room and we complain about you guys. (laughs) That's that's really really what... Ultimately happens, but, but <laughs> sorry, it's funny because it's true, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so you sit in this rooms, and it doesn't take twenty five seconds before someone says, "I had one hundred and eight people in worship this week." It doesn't take I'm seven seconds. And the question is often in the meetings, what are you guys doing this year? And, and you can see the two guys that really have stuff that the, they've ramrodded down the church's throat that they're forcing the church to do this year. And they, they've got those things written down and they can't wait to share. And then you can see the panic on the faces of the other three poor spiritual weaklings that haven't come up with a dynamic vision for the church this year. Like, I don't know, I'm just going to preach some word. And there's so sweat rolling down because they know they're going to have to talk third and they're going to have to come up with something the church is doing. And they're going to boast in the two ministries and they desperately want to come up with that. And you can see the peer pressure within the group to have some dynamic vision and some outside the box thinking thing that you're supposed to be doing. And it happens in every group you've ever been a part of too, right? Whether it's at work or wherever it is. You can see it happen. And we boast in numbers and numbers of programs and numbers of ministries. 
That's boasting in the flesh. What we ought to be saying is, I have faithfully proclaimed the Word this year. My, and we did it kind of in January. If you remember, we dedicated ourselves to faithfully proclaim the Word. We dedicated the altar. We dedicated the pulpit. Remember that? That's success. Have we been true to the Word of God? Success. But we look at numbers. The numbers may or may not follow. We see in, in Acts that 3,000 were saved in one day and so forth and all that. And that we think, oh, that must be what has to happen when we're preaching. But no, no, no. Paul didn't see that. Amen? Uh, every apostle didn't see that type of fruit coming into the kingdom. Even the men who have preached great revivals in our nation. If you read their biographies and so forth, they'll say, Never, I, I'm not quite sure why that big inpouring happened, and, but I was never able to reproduce it in my ministries. It's not an automatic that if you preach the Word of God that thousands of people are going to come flocking to the faith. That's not, if we're looking at numbers, we're looking at the wrong metric. And that leads to a lot of false gospels. If I'm looking at numbers, I may preach feel-good sermons. If I'm looking at numbers, I may preach sermons that speak to uh, how to find the baby be better babysitter or uh, how to make you feel better about not getting that promotion at work or how, how to be the better mom, how to be the better dad, how to be the better husband just for the sake of being the better dad or mother or husband instead of for the glory of Jesus Christ who is laid out in Scripture how we can do those things. And it all reflects on His nature and His character and our submission to Him. And when I vacate that to get to your ego... I'm preaching a false gospel. Be careful. Be informed consumers of the Word. All right? A true minister is desperate for Jesus Christ to be manifest and glorified in the fellowship. And if I ever get too big for my britches or too big for my hat and I start to do that, I expect you men of God and women of God to step up to me in private, I hope, and say, look, I, you're running wildly off course here. I need to hear that. I'm as prone to ego as any other man. All right. so let's take a look at Paul here. Uh, the minister's heart. And I want you to look for this in every minister that ministers to you. Let's go quickly to 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Mike did a good job of reading the rest of this, but we, we won't go through all of that. But I want you to hear Paul's heart. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, and I want you to settle for nothing less. Settle for nothing less. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 4, and then we'll read 12 through 15, okay? Paul says to the Corinthian church, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. He's, <laughs> he's being cute here, okay? Do bear with me but he's not being cute here. Verse 2. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. Sorry for the pause. I'm just thinking how short I fall on this. I feel a divine jealousy for you, saints of God, because I betrothed you to one husband, Christ, to present you as a pure Virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, your thoughts will be led away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ by false teachers. Here it comes, verse 4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, which is the Holy Spirit, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. FBC moments, would you put up with it? It's a rhetorical question, not reflect on that. Verses 12 through 15 of chapter 11. And Paul says, and what I'm doing I will continue to do, which is preach the truth and preach Jesus in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work in the same terms that we do. These are false teachers. 
Paul's saying, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ so I can undermine the testimony of those who say that they're doing what we're doing. Verse 13, for such men are false apostles. They're deceitful workmen. They disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. Church, we need to be vigilant. Verse 14, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. These are not redeemed men. Their end will correspond to their deeds. These are not saved people. False teachers that come into the pulpit and preach a false gospel are not saved people who have gone astray. They are servants of the enemy who come into the church claiming the name of Jesus, maybe even in their own mind thinking they worship him and they are teaching a false gospel. And who will stand in that day? to say we will not tolerate a false gospel preached in this church. Who would stand up in the seats where you're sitting right now and say, stop where you are. We will not tolerate a false gospel preached in this church. Do you know what courage that would take? Do you know what boldness that would take? That's an itinerant preacher. But what about me? How would you confront me? And I trust that you would. When the enemies of Satan get authority in the church, we need to confront them now, abruptly. But when brothers or sisters are errant, they're true believers and they're errant, it's a little more gentleness. And that's what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy. Gently correct your brother. Gently teach. Be patient with evil. Be kind, right, with our brothers. Because they've made a mistake. They haven't countermanded the Word of God. They've just made a mistake. But you, church, need to be vigilant. And every Saturday, we men sit around in men's Bible study. It's a Bible study. Amen, men? Amen. We're not opening some dude's commentary book. We're just, we're opening... The Bible, and we bring home to each other, it's not me beating the drum, it's us beating the drum for each other, that we will be men of God who have studied to show ourselves approved, and we will rightly divide the Word of God, and we will protect this fellowship. And we talk about that consistently, week in and week out. It's a mindset. It's something we're doing on purpose. And man, if you're sitting within this fellowship, the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you, saying, you need to become an elder in this church to protect my bride. Has that call hit the heart of any man in this church? Is there any man in this church that the Holy Spirit has said to you, you need to, and I'm, I'm going to use the term elder, but it's pastor. I am calling you to be an elder in this church. I am calling you to pastor my flock. I'm calling you to step up and become a, an elder at First Baptist Church. Has, that, has the Holy Spirit stirred that in any man? I hope so, because that's my prayer every day. Every day. Next week, Christine and I are celebrating our celebra cel I can't talk. I'm celebrating our wedding anniversary, and we're going to be out of town. And uh, someone's coming to preach who has preached here before, and I'm asking you: be vigilant. I wish that I had an elder I was serving with where we know their doctrine and we know their heart and we know who they are and we know they care about the church and we've seen their walk, we've examined them, we've installed them, we've ordained them, where they have the FBC Moments Church of stamp of approval and we know who they are that I could say, brother so-and-so, I'm going to be uh, traveling with my bride next week, need you to fill in the pulpit and they say, oh, I'm, I'm there. Then, you don't have to worry about weird doctrine as much. You still have to watch because any of us can get weird, amen? Right? Any of us, any, any of us can... You know, be a little wrong, get a little off, any, anyone can get a little sidetracked, derailed, whatever, but you, you're not worried about some stranger coming in here, don't know what they're going to preach, and that's my concern always. Because I want to see Christ formed. in you. So, we don't embrace false teachers, and we don't embrace false gospels. We need to be vigilant about that. Not paranoid about it, vigilant. There's a difference, amen, between paranoid and vigilant. Don't jump on every little mistake or every little misspoken word and say, ah, ah, pastor said to stand up and rebuke you, so I'm doing, no, no, that's not, that's not, not what I meant. Oh, 
Poor guy, he said ain't, and we're all standing up throwing him out of the church. Yeah. What I'm saying is, identify false gospels and don't let them stand, and don't let them gain footing in the fellowship. That, that's what we're to do. So we reject false teachers and false gospels, but we also boast in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Let's go back to Galatians 6, and we're going to read verses 14 through 15, and then we're going to go over, to, and you see where we're going to go up there on the screen. We don't allow false gospels, and we don't allow false teachers, and they're out there. And we know what a false gospel looks like. We know what it sounds like. So we're vigilant. We're ready. We're not paranoid, but we're ready. We're ready. We know the enemy's going to attack the church that way. But here's how we distinguish false from true gospels. The true gospel is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Galatians 6, 14 through 15. Far be it for me to boast, Paul says, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And I just Before I read verse 14, I mean 15, I, I want to expand on this just for a second. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ by which the word ha world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Remember the word for the gospel of Jesus Christ that's in Peter and that we saw? Scandalon. The scandal of the cross. False teachers remove the cross from their message because of the scandal of the cross. That's what Paul said in the previous chapter. They don't want to be scandalized for the cross of Jesus Christ. Why is it a scandal? Because it points out to us that none of us, not one human being ever born is worthy of the kingdom of God. Not one. We are all depraved and degenerate, rebellious worshipers of everything except Yahweh. We come out of the womb that way. We are steeped in sin that way. Not one of us is born that doesn't need the shed blood of Christ to cover us to wash away our sins. Not one. And we read it in Romans 3. The world hates that because they think themselves righteous. And we hate it because we think ourselves righteous. Our flesh hates it. But our regenerate life loves it. So we are separated from the world. We are holy in the world. What's holy? Set apart for God's service. Be in the world but not of the world. Right? Right? Be the salt and the light in this. Be the light and salt in this twisted and perverse generation. We are an alien thing coming into the darkness. Why are we alien? We are peculiar people. First uh, Peter two, right? We are a holy nation. We are the children of the living God, ordained by God to walk in righteousness in our stately robes, which is the righteousness of Christ, and to bring the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, into a dark and dying world. We are to proclaim this is sin and this isn't. This will send you to hell where you're headed and this will send you to glory where you don't belong. And we bo walk boldly into the world proclaiming the Gospel. We're weird to them. We are strange to them. We're brainwashed to them. We're holier than thou to them. We are profane to them. Because we don't let them rest in their alcoholism and their perversions. We don't let them sit comfortably in their adulteries and their profanities. Not only must we proclaim a gospel that's an elevated truth, but we have to live a gospel that's an elevated truth. So when they look at us, they don't see us doing the same things that they're doing. If, if, if our gospel is going to carry any weight, I mean, wouldn't you agree that we have to walk like Christ? And that's the walking in the Spirit that we just heard about last week and the week before. We're different from the world. The world's dead to us and we're dead to it. But we love them. Amen? Right? Doesn't that have to be part of it? We're not in some elitist club where we can snobbily lift our nose and say, tut, 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 to your sin. No. Our noses were formerly in the trough just like theirs are. And then Jesus saved us and picked us up like the prodigal son, put the ring back on our hand, put the clothed and robe of righteousness on our shoulders, made us privy to the entire inheritance of the entire kingdom of God and said, I have redeemed you. I have filled you with the Holy Spirit. I have made you righteous. Now go forth and get their heads out of the trough of unrighteousness because you love them and only he who has been forgiven much can love much. You need to remember from whence you came. It's so... Hard, isn't it, to walk righteously in this world without becoming arrogant? But we must. Next verse there. 15. 
Religion means nothing. Verse 15, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter. Your religion or what you've done in the name of the Lord if it's not truly in the name of the Lord. What matters? A new creation. The question isn't how religious are you? The question is, do you worship Jesus Christ? If you truly worship Jesus Christ, it's because he has regenerated your spirit and made you a new creature. Let's look at that uh, quickly. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, like is up there on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, and then we're going to read 21 to 24. Well, you can follow. It's up there on the screen. Jesus' finished work on the cross is what we boast in. 118 of 1 Corinthians. Listen now. Separate from the world, remember? Crucified to us, we're crucified to it. That's the context of these verses. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly, foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, in other words, the, the elect, to us, the, the ones that God's saving, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Isn't that true? You read the Word, you go, there's life in these words. It's alive. Every time I read it, it's something different. I can hear the Lord speaking to me. And then you share it with somebody on the street, and they're like, Psh. just some dusty old words written by some dusty old dudes in a dusty old book about dusty old history, and I don't know how that possibly applies to me. Don't you feel that? Have you ever said that to somebody? Don't you feel that? And they're like, no. I'm feeling hungry, though. Let's stop talking about this Jesus thing, which is stupid, and go get something to eat. Right? We've all probably been there in some capacity. <laughs> Verses 21 through 24. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly, the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. Remember, it's going to sound foolish to others, but the ones that are being saved, it doesn't sound like foolishness. Verse 22. The Jews demand signs, religious signs. The Greeks seek Wisdom. They want to put God in a petri dish and prove that he's true, right? Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. There is no better proof of God than Jesus' resurrection. Amen? But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, the religious set, and folly to the scientific set. Not that God doesn't play by scientific rules. He wrote the scientific rules. Amen? He put those rules in play. The universe exists because God is a scientist. All right? He structured it just perfectly. And if we break even one of those rules, boy, everything's going to spin off into the universe. The, the earth is going to burn up in unimaginable heat. We're going to rock off of our axis. We're going to stop being able to draw breath. The oceans are going to overflow their borders. The mountains are going to fall. The valleys are going to raise up. The atoms are going to cease to hold together except by the word of Christ in Hebrews. If he stops holding it together by the rules that he wrote, it ends. And Peter tells us that's exactly what's going to happen. 2 Peter 3. Have you read it? The world will disappear in flame. Why? Because God will cease to write and enforce the rules of physics. And his hands are going to come off and we're done. This whole universe will disappear. Why does it work? Because God knows what He's doing. Amen. You look at a tree and tell me there's no God, you're a fool. You look at a baby born and you tell me there's no God, you're a fool. It's a fool who says in his heart, you're no, there's no God. When you see a baby born and all those little parts are together, and they look like the person they came out of. Maybe not at first. <laughs> at first they look like a lizard. <laughs> but later, or a bullet. I remember Savannah's little head. Remember Savannah's little head? She came out of the birth canal and her head was pointed. I'm like, it's not going to stay that. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't. Who holds that information together? You say babies are born the way they are because of chromosomes and DNA. Who holds those chromosomes together? Who writes? Brown eyes, brown hair, freckles here, 
two legs that work, that tone in the voice just like mama. He's going to stand there, and from the back, you won't be able to distinguish him from his father. His sense of humor from his dad. His good looks from his mom. Perfect. Who does that? Random selection? It's foolish. A second grader knows it's foolish unless they're taught otherwise. But we love them because they're blind. Verse 24. But to those who are called, because there are scientists who get it, amen? Aren't there? To those who are called, the elect, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's what they see. There are Christian scientists, not Christian scientists. Everyone's heard of Christian science, the religion, which is neither Christian nor science. It's really weird that they call themselves Christian scientists. Right? But Christian scientists who understand that they're getting insight into how God did this when they're doing science. This experiment is to find out how God does this. What is the law that God wrote? And when they're in the medical and, and scientific, man, Christianity has been so good for science and so good for the, the acceleration of technology. Christians bring with them the wisdom of God where we go, and it, it, it elevates civilizations wherever it goes. It's amazing. I know, I got off on a little diatribe there, but it is, it's, it's, it's amazing. Let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to, and Paul was brilliant now. Paul was brilliant. He could have done that very thing, but no. Verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what I preach. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all that matters. My ability to entertain you with rhyme and consonants is not important. And I'm glad because I can't do either of those things. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Isn't that what you want from a teacher of the Word of God? Weakness, knowing that all wisdom comes from the Spirit. Fear and trembling because I I know that I'm, I'm insufficient for the task of preaching apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And my speech and my message, verse 4, were not in, in, in plausible words of wisdom, worldly wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that your faith might be in Paul, the preacher. Nope. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men or science or anything else, but in the power of the living God. How do you know the Gospel's being preached? Verse 4. The demonstration of the Spirit in power. What is that? Is that a wild exhibition of weirdness that freaks everybody in the room out? Nope. The demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power is regenerated souls and growing Christians. That's it. Salvation and sanctification is the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. I rhymed it. Did you see? I I didn't even mean to. It's not even in my notes. Cool. I I can rhyme. All right? (laughs) By by the mercy of of Jesus Christ, okay? But the confirmation, the proof is in the pudding. Do you want to know if a church is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Look at the people and see if they look like Jesus Christ. That's how. That's how. All right. We boast in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Uh, You can go back uh, to Galatians 6 uh, now if you would be so kind. Galatians, uh, Galatians 6. 16. Why boast in the crucified Messiah? Because through His atoning death and only His atoning death, He makes new spiritual creatures out of dead flesh. You don't get closer to God through religion. Did you know that? Of course you do. You're here every week. You don't get closer to God as a lost person through religion. Through doing what the pastor says. Through kneeling here and standing there. Through going in that little closet there and saying this and that. Through repeating this from memory. From lighting that candle. From any of that. You don't get any closer. If you're you're not regenerate, you get no closer to God through any of that. However, if once you're born again and you start to do things for the glory of God, then you can get greater intimacy with God. 
But that, is, that relationship, that saving relationship was established by God. Look, let's, let's look here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. should be up on the screen for you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. I don't know if you understand how powerful that is. We breeze past that. If anyone's in, he's a new creation. You were dead, now you're alive. Don't you see? The old has passed away. Sin, law, flesh. Behold, the new has come. Faith, salvation. All this is from God. Not God and Tim Philkins. All this is from God, who through Christ, God the Son, reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We take the Gospel to the lost world, right? That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself. Not everyone in the world, but those He's saving. Not counting their trespasses against them. Amen. And entrusting to us, His church, the message of reconciliation. Be careful what we're standing against and remember what we're standing for. Amen? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Whew. That ought to humble you and drive you to your knees right there. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal to the world through us. Mercy, mercy, mercy. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, listen, for the sake of the elect, for the sake of those He's saving, for our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him, Jesus Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. There ain't a whole lot of me in that passage. But there's an awful lot of Jesus Christ making me the righteousness of God. So we reject lies and liars. We boast in Jesus Christ and the cross. But we also have to love the brotherhood. Wrapping up with this. We need to embrace those who bear the marks of Jesus. Galatians 6, 16-17. And as for all who walk by this rule, grace, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's another sermon right there, but the Israel of God is not ethnic Israel. The Israel of God is all saved people. We've been reading about that all through Galatians. I won't read it again, because we've got to go, but we did read it in Galatians 3, 7-9, through 9, Galatians 3, 26-29, how we are children of the promise, the covenant of God. God made a covenant. He said, I will redeem my people. Everyone who places their faith in Christ comes under that covenant of Christ. We become the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We are adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. That is God's Israel. We are brothers and sisters with our Jewish brothers and sisters who have also placed their faith in Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. And much of the New Testament's written about it. I encourage you to read the whole New Testament for your homework. Okay? Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus Christ. And finally, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Amen. We're going to have everyone stand and have the singers come as we close.